Hi there, this is Solitary Ronin from Solitary Ronin Films and welcome to another random review. Today's random review is Session 9 from 2001. Now in real estate, location, location, location is a common used phrase and this is a film that certainly qualifies for that. Um, this is about a group of asbestos removal workers who are hired to clear out an old abandoned mental asylum and creepy things start happening. But what makes this film quite interesting is the fact it was actually shot in an abandoned mental, in mental institution just outside of Boston, called the Danvers Institute, which bizarrely, some of it has been knocked down, but some of it remains, and are luxury condos. Um, so it was originally built in 1878, and it was stopped use in 1982, um, so it was pretty much abandoned for almost 20 years before um, writer-director Brad Anderson discovered it. Um, and decided to write a film and shoot the film there. Um, Brad Anderson, probably most famous for doing The Machinist with Christian Bale. Um, this film stars Peter Mullen and David Caruso just before he did CSI Miami. So there's no crouching and taking off sunglasses in this film by Mr Caruso. Um, and Josh Lucas... Um, it was made for a million dollars, shot on digital, um, the shoot was only 22 days, and while it might not be the greatest film ever made, it does show you how you can make an atmospheric, creepy little film for a small budget, short shooting schedule, um, with only five of a cast. Um, or st well, seven speaking. Um, well, I suppose more speaking, but um, pretty much five of a cast. Um, Peter Mullen stars as a man who desperately needs this contract. Um, his company is slowly going under, so um, in order to get a ten thousand dollar bonus, instead of um, originally perhaps being a three week job he says they can get it finished in a week um, David Caruso is his um, kind of foreman and Josh Lucas is the kind of um, arsehole of the bunch who is um, now going out with David Caruso's ex-girlfriend so there's tension there there's a character called Mike who seems to be the smartest of the bunch who was going to be training to be a lawyer, but he's ended up in the asbestos business. And we also have um, Jeff, who is um, Peter Mullen. It's his nephew who he's taken on to give an extra hand, who quite coincidentally has a fear of the dark, which obviously um, comes in really handy later in the film, in one of the films. Um, two really standout sequences when obviously he's faced with being in the dark. Um, it's a slow burn. It is obviously pretty much a riff on The Shining. Um, and obviously it's not as good as Kubrick's film. Let's put a stop to that rumour right now. Um, but it's a really effective little film. Um, the security guard who lets them in at the start kind of tells them, oh yeah, it was shut down for budget cuts. Um, but 
Mike has read up on it. You know, tells this story of, you know, one of the patients and the things that happened to her. There's really the production design, you know, they didn't have to do much. Um, it's just wonderful. They say the equipment was lying about as if it had just been abandoned and everybody had left. There was, at one point, almost two and a half thousand patients. The place is described by the guy who shows them round as a bat. So they have the central core of the building and then they have two kind of crooked wings on either side, the female patients and the male patients. So it just has this odd look architecturally um, and they have certain levels they're told of one area and that's where the psychotics were um, again as Brad Anderson says in the extras which I'll, I'll get to because there's a ton of really good extras in the release of Second Sight um, you could have easily made this as a group of teenagers who go in and get bumped off and could have just made a slasher film. But this goes more for the psychological aspect. Peter Mullen's character being pushed to the limit of his stress. Obviously you have the friction between David Caruso and Josh Lucas's character. Um, you know, at the facility... Um, like I said, it was opened in 1870 in real life, um, and in 1948 they started doing lobotomies on patients. You know, characters find ledgers and we go through the reasons why people were incarcerated in here, and it was just like, you know, for being far too passionate, or like it was just fairly menial reasons, people were just locked away um, by the state, and obviously lobotomized and we kind of get a demonstration of how they lobotomized people um, and Mike who's the more kind of inquisitive one and knows about the or is fascinated by the history of the place he finds tapes in a room in the basement um, which go from session one to session nine that's why it's called session nine um, so not only do we have the shining thing of going, they've got a week to complete the job and the director has Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday come up on the screen. We also have him going through the tapes from session one to session nine. Um, the patient on the tape has three um, personalities. It's a young girl called Mary, a young woman called Mary. Um, and she has Billy, who's her protector, and she also has a character called Simon, who you'll be able to figure out what part Simon plays in the whole thing. Um, you can actually see on the back of the box, that's the actual building. I mean, it is an amazing looking building. Um, not a building I particularly want to spend any time in, but... Um, it's a pretty amazing building. Um, so in the special edition, as with other second sites, you get some postcards. Which are really cheery. I mean, that's a lovely image. I mean, that is the first image in the film, but it's upside down. And then it slowly rotates round to the right way up. Um, and you have, obviously, the booklet which is lovely and has um, essays and photographs because um, some of the murals that were actually left in the building weren't actually dressed by the crew. Um, the patients had rooms which were called seclusion rooms and some of them had um, kind of collages of strange things kind of like the that sequence in the parallax view where you're just showing images, you know, of father, mother, America, gun, all of that stuff. Um, and that becomes a key kind of um, note in the film as we discover more about Mary. Um, there's a wonderful 
cemetery where all the bodies are just marked by you know their case file number um, and there's a beautiful tree where Peter Mullen at one point you go down little steps and you're in the cemetery and Peter Mullen's sitting in the cemetery in this lovely kind of broken tree um, this is a two disc set like I said the extras are substantial and really good um, on the feature film disc the extras are ported over from Shout Factory to release or Scream Factory I guess um, and the second disc is all brand new extras by Second Sight um, there's two commentaries um, one by Brad Anderson the director and co-writer Stephen um, Geridon, who plays Mike in the film. Um, there's a commentary by Mike White and Jed Ayers. There's a new interview with Brad Anderson. There's a new interview with Stephen Geridon. Um, there's new interviews with the producer and the DP. I'll, I'll get to the story about the DP in a little bit. Um, there's a new interview with the production designer. There's a new interview with the composers. The sound design in the film is great. And the the score is by the Climax Golden Twins, which I'd never heard of, which are kind of experimental, just odd layerings of sound. So the score is really effective. The sound design in the film is really effective. Again, this is a film without, spoiler alert, without like lots of ghosts and ghoulies. It's all about um, atmosphere. Um, and Alexandra Heller Nicholas, who has become quite prolific, she's right up there with Kat Ellinger as far as being um, on lots of releases. She does a really good um, video essay called A Twisted Collage. There's a feature length Return to Danvers documentary. Um, there's a archival making of. Um, Peter Mullen and David Caruso aren't on the kind of retro documentary about the film, but they are on the um, archival in, um, piece. There's an episode of um, Horrors Hallowed Grounds. There's a story board to screen um, feature with direct com with the director commentary on that as well. There's deleted scenes and an alternate ending with the director commentary as well. The feature length, co the feature length commentary, the feature length um, retrospective documentary is excellent. If you're one of those film fans who like to hear about the making of films that perhaps odd things happened, then session nine is up your street because odd things happened. Um, Peter Mullen tells the story of when he was on the roof. Um, whether he's just doing this to try and sell the film. Um, he kind of heard a voice that told him to jump. Um, but he said it wasn't like a suicidal thought, it was just a kind of suggestion out of curiosity to see whether he would fly or float. Um, and there's a three-way telling of a very strange event. You know, one of the characters, as I said earlier, demonstrates how lobotomies were done by putting like something through the, the eye which is thoroughly horrible um, and while they were shooting another really effective scene um, where Hank the character played by Josh Lucas is running through these tunnels with cages the DP actually hit a bit of an equipment and got something in her eye um, and there was blood and they were like freaking out because they obviously thought she might have been blinded and then when they got to the hospital there wasn't really that much um, there. The doctor just said she had a bruise in her eye. Um, but it was just all very strange. At one point Josh Lucas says he wanted to leave the film just because there was so much, so many little odd things going on. Um, there's a shot in the film above... The building and the sky looks weird but that's not actually a special effect because as Josh Lucas says 
on like the second day of filming, the sky was like that. Um, and it's just like weird stories. Um, and they do remark at one point that it is funny that there's now condos in the same building and people are actually living in luxury apartments in the same place where there used to be um, lobotomies going on. It's just a wonderful, creepy, atmospheric, low budget, shot in digital, but it's not that jarring digital. Um, some of the wide shots are really nice. The production design, again, they didn't have to do that much. They obviously did some. Um, they also talk about the fact they're playing people who are removing asbestos. And, of course, there was as asbestos in the building when they were shooting it. Um, but as long as the asbestos doesn't get dry, it's fine, apparently. Um, but just the whole atmosphere, the little details of the collages... The sound design, the slow layering of information we get as Mike listens to the tapes from session one up to session nine. Um, it's just a lovely little film. Um, but again, if you're if you're afraid of the dark, like the character Jeff. Um, it's maybe not the film for you. But again, even though it's not, you know, it doesn't have the meaning of life in it, it is a perfect example of how you can make a really effective little film if you get a wonderful location, even if it's a bit creepy. Um, low budget, short shooting schedule, a small dedicated cast, you can actually make really... Um, interesting little films but certainly a film where the story behind the making of the film is just as interesting as the film itself um, Session 9 and a really good release by Second Sight um, obviously they will be releasing a standard edition without the bells and whistles um, as they do with all the releases so thanks very much for watching this random view on Session 9 from way back in the year of 2001 and hopefully you'll join me again for more random reviews. This is Solitary Ronin from Solitary Ronin Films. Saying farewell.